Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I am Yeltsin, and today we're going to read three short stories. These are all fictional, but honestly you never really know what's out there. Now these stories were written by my friend Zach. If you're interested in seeing some more of his stuff, please check the description. I'm going to have his information there. Also, if you guys do enjoy today's video, please be sure to hit that like button. It would really help me out. That being said, if you have a short story, either fictional or real, that you would like to submit, be sure to check the description as well. My email is going to be listed there. Alright, let's go ahead and jump into our first story. This one is entitled, Some Empty Houses Might Really Be Haunted. Some houses stare out at the street with vacant eyes. These empty houses, their rooms are filled with echoing silence. Children stare back and make up stories that will be passed on a verbal inheritance. They say the house sees them, or that something inside does, and sometimes they're right. These are not hauntings in the fashion that film and TV would have you believe. Our paranoia creates stories and urban legends based on these. In truth, a haunting is a memory the house has to exist with. Memories are like temporal stains, and some, like blood or spaghetti sauce, are more stubborn than others. An abusive parent, a hug when you need it most, that favorite meal, watching a loved one wither away, the death of a beloved family pet. Each of these things leaves its mark on us and on the places they happen in. This is why some homes feel warm and welcoming. They are haunted with good memories. Some stains are easily scrubbed out with love, care, and elbow grease, but others only fade over time, and some never completely. For instance, the derelict house on Kentucky Street in Racine, Wisconsin has been empty for 30 years. It looks like a haunted house in every sense of the word, but it is just a decrepit shell. The house four doors down though? The one vacant for a year? In that house, a drunken, depressed mother drowned her baby before taking her own life in the same tub. Her husband found them embracing in an overflowing crimson tub. The last family to move in left after less than a year. The bathroom made the children uneasy and they said that they saw someone in the tub or heard soft crying in the night. The mother thought that they were making it up until she experienced it too. In Mission Hills, Kansas, on Verona Street, a family is plagued by an unseen force that opens cabinets and throws objects. The man that used to live in the house died in the kitchen. He had a heart attack while assaulting his wife, throwing cutlery and foodstuffs at her. And in Breckenridge, Colorado, a child that lives on Discovery Hill Drive is at first surprised, but later comforted by the shadow that visits his doorway each night, and sometimes sits on the edge of his bed. Forty years ago, a father used to check on his children, and he'd often spend a few minutes watching them sleep. He would dream about the amazing things they would accomplish in the future and the people they would become. He worried about how good of a parent he was. He lived long enough to know he had done a good job and celebrate most of their accomplishments with them. Some houses might really be haunted, but the empty ones are the most suspect because of their hidden histories. The truth is all houses are haunted, but it will never tell you about what it saw. Only look at you with hollow, pleading eyes, wishing it could. So I know there's definitely been times I've been in homes that didn't feel quite right. Maybe this is exactly what he was talking about. Maybe it was those haunted memories just coming back. Our second story is entitled, The Sleeping Face. Patrick was incredibly excited to have his girlfriend, Alice, move in. They'd been dating for about a year and they felt it was finally time. Things had been going exceptionally well. They quickly became inseparable and, and talk of the future had been occurring. The one thing that always stuck out to Patrick though was the nightlight. Alice always had a nightlight on at night. Her place, his place, while sleeping, making love, always the nightlight was on in its full brilliant glory. He had tried to shut it off once when he couldn't sleep and Alice had become panicked, saying she needed it on that she was scared. He hadn't brought it up since. Her security overshadowed any inconvenience for him. The first few weeks were amazing. Relaxing after work together, cooking together, even grocery shopping was just better. And every night when they went to bed, 
The nightlight's soft yellow glow emanated from the corner, until the storm came, that is. The storm came through one evening and knocked out the power to Patrick's apartment building. Alice immediately panicked. Patrick, I need the nightlight. You don't understand, she cried. I know I don't. It's going to be okay. I'll be here with you all night, he replied, gently rubbing her upper back. We could leave a flashlight on, if you think that will help. She looked at him, calming but sniffling, and nodded before hugging him. Before bed, Patrick stood the flashlight on end on his nightstand, its light refracting off the ceiling. Are you sure it'll last all night? Alice asked. Patrick looked from her to the flashlight. I think so. I hope so. Alice trailed off. She fidgeted, still unsettled. Slowly, Alice drifted off to sleep. Patrick, however, found he could not rest. The flashlight was brighter than the nightlight, and his fan was off. This is going to be a long night, he thought to himself as he laid there. He looked to the flashlight briefly, thinking about turning it off, but immediately refused the idea for the woman he loved so dearly. Turning to look at her, he smiled. She was so peaceful, and despite her fear, felt safe. An hour of staring at the ceiling passed before Patrick realized that something was wrong. The light was dimmer and fading quickly. He turned and shook the flashlight. A couple bright flashes coming, but it continued to go out. As the last of the light faded, Patrick gently sighed, defeated. He would just do his best to console her if she woke up in the night. He rolled over to face her, her face now bathed in shadow. He studied her face in the darkness, now only the dim light of the street lamps providing the faintest light through the window behind him. His eyes adjusted as he looked at Alice, her skin glowing pale blue. Her eyes, however, appeared deeply obscured in the darkness, dark blues fading into blackness. It was vaguely haunting to see her like this. A sudden awareness snapped him out of his thoughts. Her eyes weren't closed anymore. A knot began to slowly form in his stomach, a deep feeling of dread from the primal regions of Patrick's brain screaming that something is wrong. Alice's eyes slowly moved to meet his, the gaze feeling predatory. Her mouth opened. A seemingly bottomless void rimmed with fangs, and a broken crackling screech emanated from it. Patrick pushed himself backwards, tumbling off the edge of the bed. He struck the side of his head on the nightstand, sending the flashlight and his phone flying. He landed hard in the sheet-tangled heap. Patrick, dazed and disoriented, looked up, seeing Alice in a crouched, feral stance on the bed. She tilted her head looking at him and made several clicking sounds. She began creeping towards him on all fours her eyes never leaving his. A throaty growl came from deep within her. Patrick felt consciousness start to slip from him as Alice's fanged visage came creeping over. Her mouth opened, her breath hot against his throat, and suddenly, a brilliant light followed by a deafening shriek. Patrick saw Alice reel back, covering her face before he finally passed out. When he awoke, the bedroom lights were on, but Alice was gone. Patrick's head throbbed painfully as he tried to untangle his legs and stand. After freeing himself, he stumbled around looking for Alice, but only found a note simply saying, I'm sorry. So, always be careful who you're lying down next to. You never know what lies beneath that beautiful face. Our third story is called The Pumpkin Patch. Joey Cabot sits crying on the small back porch of his house. The light shines from behind him, hiding his face in shadow. His sobs create puffs of steam in the chill late November air. He cries not from loss or the worn, splintered wood biting into his backside, but from abuse. You see, his father, Randall, is a drunk. A mean one. Tonight, it was a split lip and a blackened eye for coughing during his TV dinner. Last week, it was a speck of food missed on the dishes. The light suddenly goes out and Joey turns to see his father, Randall's face nearly touching the glass with the glare of drunken insanity that says, if you like making sound, you'll stop making it now. No question left in his message. In terror at the madness looking through the glass, Joey sprints away, the sudden massive intake of cold air stinging his lungs. Behind him, the door bangs open and he realizes if he doesn't get away, he'll die tonight. Tearing his way through the woods, Joey can hear his father's heavy, stumbling footfalls. Luckily, Joey can navigate the woods much faster thanks to being small for a nine-year-old and not hopelessly drunk. 
The thorns and sickers of a brush cause him to cry out in fear as they snag his shirt. He feels no pain in this, only more terror as he hears Randall approaching quickly. Finally breaching the woods, Joey enters the pumpkin patch. The scent of autumn and decaying squash fill his nose. His father yells in the woods, not having exited yet, but not far enough away for any comfort. Will any distance be great enough? He thinks absently. The thought causes him to softly chuckle, a dry, maddening sound that scares him even more. His run slows, muscles burning as the cold sinks in. Halfway through the pumpkin patch, he trips on a vine, his knee striking a rock as he hits the ground. He cries out as blood begins to soak into his torn jeans. What do you fear, little one? The voice paralyzes him. There is no echo, no distortion, only the low, rumbling voice. You are hurt. I f fell, Joey says. He can feel that something is there, something is with him, and then feels its attention pulled away. Joey! Found you, boy! From about a hundred yards behind Joey, Randall, slick with sweat and dirt, stumbles forward. Joey begins to scramble backward, terror gripping him, but drunken determination makes Randall eerily fast and the gap closes quickly. At ten yards away, Randall stops, his foot seemingly caught in the decaying vines. As he pulls, trying to free himself, Joey sees another vine slowly wrap around Randall's left ankle. Randall pulls his right foot hard as he can, but falls backward, his balance compromised. Sitting up, Joey sees his father struggle, trying to rise but vines gripping his wrist. Help me, boy. Get me loose, Randall pleads. Joey moves away. Randall has pulled this trick too often. I will kill you when I get loose, just like your mama when you left her belly, Randall screams, his rage boiling over. As Randall struggles to free himself, a shifting sound grabs Joey's attention. A large pumpkin a few feet away gently rocks in the dirt. The shell splits and lengthens and two protrusions pierce the top. Two of the cracks open, a dark hollowness inside, and then a very small but brilliant orange light appears in each. The pumpkin slowly lifts on a neck made of vine, the jagged pumpkin shell mouth falling slightly open, bits of clinging root and fiber hanging out. The protrusions grow into magnificent and grotesque antlers, the sinuous guts of the pumpkin dangling from them. The mouth stretches until it seems like it's stretched over the skull of a massive dog. Legs of vine pull from the dirt, followed by ribs, large haunches, and a tail. The skeletal form of the creature is now the size of a cow, but distinctly canine in shape. It shakes, a cloud of dirt billowing out from its mane and matted roots that tapers down its back. The few green leaves on its tail and stem flutter. The creature looks at Joey, but while its disturbing eyes are filled with fury, somehow Joey understands that this fury is not for him. As the creature turns its vengeful, piercing gaze, Randall finally realizes that they are not alone. What in the fuck is that? He breathlessly whispers. As the creature takes a step forward, Randall's eyes grow huge, the sobering realization of his mortality dawning. He screams and struggles the vines cutting into his flesh as his bladder releases. The creature bides its time, moving slowly, seeming to relish in Randall's fear. Its head lowers, the antlers raking the dirt, plowing a series of symmetrical lines. In an almost ritualistic fashion, it circles Randall, leaving the plow marks in its wake. The creature then stands over Randall, regarding him. It is evident that it finds him wanting. What are you? Randall screams. I am your winter. The beast lowers its antlers, pressing them slowly into Randall's chest. Randall never manages to scream. The rising is choked off by his blood. Joey wants to look away as the beast does its work, but finds he cannot. The creature is his savior. Its gnarled form twists and shakes free, Randall's blood appearing black in the moonlight. With a sudden stiff wind on a previously still night, the creature blows away into dust. And so let this be a reminder, while this scenario might not play out exactly as it did here, karma is a bitch. So be nice to each other, my friends. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's stories. And as a reminder, if you do have a story that you'd like to submit yourself, 
check the description for my email. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next episode.